look with me in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. I have a word to share with you called overwhelmed, trapped, and dying. It's actually an encouraging word, don't worry. Uh, but let's look at an experience in the life of Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Let's begin in verse 3. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion, and the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort overflows through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings that we suffer. And our hope for you is firmly guaranteed because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you will share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will always deliver us. He'll do this as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted in answer to the prayers of many. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to minister. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the people that you love so much. Thank you for your presence here and your powerful word. I pray that you'd breathe life. I pray, Lord, that you'd send comfort from heaven for your people. In Jesus' name of your heart of grief, say amen. amen. It was said of Jesus that if all the miracles that he performed were written down, the world would not be able to contain the books. The Gospels are just a sample of everything that Jesus said and did. And so it is with the life of the Apostle Paul. The record of Paul's ministry in the book of Acts is just a portion of his experiences. For example, on five different occasions, Paul received 39 lashes from the Jewish authorities, but Acts doesn't tell us anything about that. Prior to Acts chapter 27, on three previous occasions, Paul was shipwrecked and he even spent 24 hours treading water in the open sea, but Acts doesn't tell us anything about that. Paul was in danger from rivers. Paul was in danger from bandits. He was seriously sick, but Acts doesn't tell us about it. When Paul sat down to write this letter that we call 2 Corinthians, it was fresh on the ordeal, uh, on the heels of the worst ordeal of his life. What it was, we cannot say. Paul doesn't elaborate, and Luke didn't write about it. Some people think that Paul survived an assassination attempt or a lynch mob. It's quite possible that Paul survived a bout of sickness that almost took his life. But whatever this ordeal was, Paul tells us in no uncertain terms how it affected him. He says in verse 8, this ordeal completely overwhelmed us. It was beyond our capacity to endure. It was beyond our strength. He uses a Greek word that describes a ship that is so overloaded it's sinking or a pack animal that has such a heavy load that it is collapsing under the weight of the load. He said it was too much for us. We were overcome. Paul also says in verse 8, we saw no way out of this. He says we despaired for our very life. The Greek word there literally means that we were barred from escaping alive. In verse 9, Paul says we felt within ourselves that we were going to die. We felt in our hearts as if we had been handed a death sentence, possibly by God himself. What was this perfect storm? 
We don't know for sure, but we do know that Paul was completely overwhelmed, that he saw no way out, and that he felt quite certain he was going to die. Overwhelmed, trapped, and dying. I wonder how many people have ever been there. I wonder if someone here might be there right now. Maybe you're overwhelmed by circumstances in your life right now. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe it's your kids. Maybe it's someone you love. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's your finances. Whatever it is, you're not sure that you can bear up under this much longer. Maybe you feel trapped. Like Paul, you see no way out of your situation. You see no light at the end of the tunnel. You see no solution. Maybe you feel trapped by an addiction or by some life-controlling problem and you've lost hope that you will ever be truly free from it. Maybe you feel like you've been handed a death sentence. Maybe you're wrestling with the idea that the way things are in your life right now is the way your story is going to end. It's too late now. There's never going to be change. Things are never going to be better. Maybe you've received a medical diagnosis and it feels like a death sentence. You're not sure that you're going to recover. Overwhelmed, trapped, and dying. Paul says... We were there. But looking at his words here in 2 Corinthians 1, I find some words of hope and some words of help, if ever, we're overwhelmed or trapped or dying. And I want to share them with you quickly this morning. Words of hope and words of help, if ever we're overwhelmed, trapped, or dying. First, this. Remember who our Father is. 2 Corinthians begins differently than most other letters. Paul skips over the usual pleasantries and he bursts into a note of high praise to God. Blessed be God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, God had brought Paul through such an awful ordeal that Paul's heart was overflowing with praise. His heart was overflowing with gratitude. He couldn't help himself. His faith was renewed in who God is. Because God is who he is, Paul made it through this trial. He survived. He prevailed. He recovered. And if, oh, if ever we're overwhelmed or trapped or dying, we can make it through too if we remember who our Father is. Amen. Remember that He is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to wax theological for just a moment, but I want you to stay with me. Don't leave me because he who endures to the end will speak in tongues. All right, listen. <laughs> in the Bible... God is the father of Jesus in a unique sense. God is not the father of Jesus in the same sense that I am the father of Benjamin Harvison, who looks very handsome ushering today. <laughs> God did not create Jesus. God did not give life to Jesus in the same way that I gave life to my son. Jesus is and always has been co-equal and co-eternal with the father. When the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, those words mean his one and only son, his one of a kind, unique son. There has never been another like him and there never will be. The father-son relationship speaks for one thing of different roles within the Trinity. The son is subject to the father. The spirit is subject to the son. And all three of them exist in perfect harmony and unity. But the father-son relationship points especially to the incarnation and the messianic ministry of Jesus. And to say that God is the father of Jesus Christ is to say that God was the originator of the incarnation and the ministry of Jesus. God was the one who was behind all of it. God was the author of the whole thing. It was his idea. God was the source and the supernatural power of the whole thing. 
What did Gabriel tell Mary? He said, the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. You see, the virgin birth of Jesus originated with the Father. The life of Jesus originated the earthly ministry of Jesus. The sufferings of Jesus on my behalf, it originated with the Father. The cross originated with the Father. It was his idea. It was the Father who handed over the Son to be crucified. The resurrection originated with the Father. God raised Jesus from the dead. The great high priestly ministry of Jesus in heaven on my behalf, it originated with the Father. But how exactly does that help me if ever I'm overwhelmed or trapped or dying? Well, quite simply this. To say that God is the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ means that he is the author of my salvation. He determined from the very beginning to save me. He conceived the plan to save me. He put the plan in motion to save me. He sacrificed himself to save me. And he has saved me. My salvation is in his heart. Salvation is in his plan for me. Salvation is who he is and what he does. And if ever I'm overwhelmed or trapped or dying, I can trust that he will yet save me. Remember who our father is. He is the father of compassion. Not only is God the author of salvation... But God is the originator of compassion. Mercy originates with him. Kindness originates with him. Tenderness, empathy, lenience. It, it, it originates with him. Patience. It originates with him. Faithfulness originates with him. His love endures forever. David said, like a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on us. He remembers that we're just dust. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all that he made. Micah said, who is a God like you who pardons sin and forgives transgressions? You delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You see, if I, as an earthly father, can't bear to see one of my children suffering, how much more will my heavenly father have compassion on me when I'm overwhelmed or trapped or dying? Remember who our father is. He is the God of all comfort. Do you know those are remarkable words? What other God worshipped on earth can be called a comfort giver? You know the gods of the Hindus and the Buddhists are mostly indifferent to suffering. Sometimes the cause of suffering, the spirits that are worshipped by animists, they haunt and they curse and they torment, they play tricks on men. Even Allah of Islam is called in the Quran the greatest deceiver. On the island of Bali, five times a day, people put out little cardboard trays, the kind that you get french fries in from Walter's Hot Dogs. They put out little cardboard trays with flower petals and pieces of fruit and incense in them to appease their gods. And the Balinese never travel far from home. They never go away because they're afraid that if someone forgets to make the offering that their gods will curse them and bring calamity and sickness and financial ruin on them. Other gods are not good, but our God is the God of comfort. He's the source of divine help. He's the source of rescue from suffering. He's the source of soothing from sorrow. He's the source of healing from sadness. He's the source of encouragement. He's the source of renewed strength. He's the source of beauty from ashes. He's the source of mental and emotional and volitional stability. He is our source of peace. And if it wasn't enough to say that he is the God of comfort, Paul says he is the God of all comfort. Amen. 
That means for every type of earthly sorrow, God has a heavenly remedy. Listen, that's an amazing thought. If you don't get happy over that, I'm going to speak in tongues myself. <laughs> Beloved, listen to me. There is absolutely nothing that you or I could ever suffer on earth for which God does not have a heavenly remedy. There is no sorrow. There is no rejection. There is no hurt. There is no abuse, verbal or emotional or physical or sexual. There is no betrayal. There is no loss that is beyond his ability to comfort. Paul says he comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any kind of trouble. There's a song on Caleb I like right now. The lyric says, Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. And it's true. The God of all comfort also means that his comfort comforts completely and permanently. His comfort doesn't make things just a little bit better. His comfort makes everything all the way better. His comfort doesn't make things temporarily better. It makes things permanently better. There are so many people in pain today. And they medicate to find relief. They use alcohol. They use pharmaceuticals. They use drugs. They use sex. They use food. But that kind of comfort doesn't last long. It's temporary. But God has promised us complete and permanent comfort. He said through the prophet Isaiah, I will comfort you like a mother comforts her child. And so you will ever be comforted. And here's the thing to remember, if ever you're overwhelmed or trapped or dying, this God, he is our Father, this author of salvation, this originator of compassion, this source of all comfort, he is our Dad. Through faith in Christ, we now belong to the Father, and the Father now belongs to us. Through Jesus, we have become organically connected. His very life flows in us. We now address God using Jesus' own personal words of prayer, Abba, Father. And God has promised, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not live in fear. Amen. Words of hope and help, if ever you're overwhelmed or trapped or dying, remember who our Father is. Second, remember that our Father wastes nothing. I have to tell you, truthfully, I'm not particularly fond of fish. But I have to say, in Indonesia, they have the most excellent fish. It's white and it's flaky and it's coated with these amazing spices and it's served with these delicious sauces. But I notice that there's a difference in the way that Americans eat fish and Indonesians eat fish. Here, we only eat the very best part from the sides of the fish. You know, we eat the nice uh, meaty part right in the middle and we throw everything else away. But in Indonesia, they eat the whole thing. They eat the head, they eat the lips, they eat the eyes, they take the skin, they scrape it with their teeth. They don't waste anything. And when I saw that, I realized that God is not an American. He is actually Indonesian. <laughs> Because God wastes absolutely nothing in our lives, good, bad, or ugly, God uses all of it for his glory and our good. Yeah. <laughs> Beloved, here's a tweetable truth that you can hold on to if ever you're overwhelmed or trapped or dying. God didn't perpetrate it, but God has a purpose in it. Listen, that's good preaching right there. God didn't perpetrate it, but God has a purpose in it. God didn't perpetrate it, but God has a purpose in it. God had a purpose in this horrible ordeal that Paul suffered, and so it is with us. Remember, our Father wastes nothing. God uses hardships to break us of self-reliance and to bring us to a place of total reliance on Him. All of us know those little words from 
Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. You could say it with me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. See, the thing about that little verse is I, I found that it's a lot easier to memorize than it is to live. <laughs> Apparently, Paul found that to be the case too. Even after the dramatic conversion on the Damascus Road, even after all the ministry, all the miracles, all the converts, even after all his travels and all his trials, Paul still battled with the inner inclination to trust his own instincts rather than God. He still fought the tendency to follow his own logic, to walk in his own wisdom, to function in his own strength. Whatever this horrible ordeal, God was not the perpetrator of it, but God said, you know, I can use that for my good purposes. When Paul came to the end of himself, he was ready to rely on God more deeply than ever. When he came to the end of himself, his faith in God grew bigger. Now, if the Apostle Paul, the great Paul, could use that kind of breaking and that kind of building up of faith, then I suppose that none of us here is above it either. Maybe Pastor Nick, but none of the rest of us. <laughs> God doesn't perpetrate our hardships, but he does use them for his own good purposes. Hebrew says God uses hardships as discipline. Listen, not punishment, as training. It's not fun while we're going through it, but afterwards, oh, what good results. James says, consider it joy when you go through many kinds of trials because these tests are building your faith and making you mature. Remember, our Father wastes nothing. God uses hardships to make us into channels of his comfort to others. Something absolutely amazing happens when we come to Jesus Christ. The God of all comfort goes through all of our experiences, past, present, and he administers heaven's perfect remedy. He gives us complete and permanent healing for everything we've suffered in life. But you know, once we've received that comfort, it doesn't just dissipate. It remains alive inside of us and it becomes a reservoir for ministry to others. Paul says, just as the sufferings of Christ overflow into our lives, so also through Christ, our comfort overflows to you. You know, when God has brought us through hardships, we talk to people differently. We talk to people with empathy, with compassion, with kindness. We have more patience. We apply the word to them a, a little bit more tenderly, speaking the truth in love. We encourage, we speak hope, we speak life, we prophesy better things over them. When God has brought us through hardships, we pray for people differently. We entreat the Father fervently on their behalf because we know the pain that they're going through. We pray with earnest faith because we know that the God who has delivered and comforted us can deliver and comfort them. We lay hands on people and we impart to them that supernatural comfort that we've received. Listen, here's a word for someone in the house today. As you look at your life and you look at the amount of hardships you've faced, it seems like you've had more than your fair share. But just think about the ministry that God has prepared for you. As you're going through hardships right now, just think about the ministry that God is preparing for you. Just think about how God is equipping you to minister every kind of heavenly remedy for every kind of earthly sorrow. Remember that our Father wastes nothing. God uses hardships to glorify himself through our testimony of victory. Paul says this was a horrible ordeal, but it wasn't for nothing. Our faith grew, our capacity to minister grew, and he says our testimony caused many people to give glory to God. Beloved, as you think about the hardships in your life that God is bringing you through, just think about the glory that you're about to bring to him.
How much glory is God going to receive when you stand up and testify, I was abused, but the God of all comfort has restored me. I was betrayed. I was abandoned, but the God of all comfort has repaired my broken heart. I was addicted, but the God of all comfort has set me free. I had cancer, but the God of all comfort healed me. I had Alzheimer's. I had Parkinson's. I had diabetes. I had arthritis, but the God of all comfort, he healed me. Amen. Words of hope and help. If ever you're overwhelmed or trapped or dying, remember who our Father is. Remember that our Father wastes nothing. And finally this, remember what our Father has guaranteed. Worship team, you can come and help me if you would. Remember what our Father has guaranteed. In the opening lines of 1 Corinthians, we came across a word guarantee. Paul says there in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, he says, God has guaranteed that you will make a strong finish. Those were remarkable words to a very messed up church. I don't care how messed up it is, God is still able to cause it to have a strong finish. In the opening lines of 2 Corinthians, that word guarantee appears again. Paul says in verse 7, our hope concerning you is firmly guaranteed. Just as you share in sufferings, so we know that you will be comforted. Remember what our Father has guaranteed. He has guaranteed that He will comfort you even in the face of death itself. You know, while you're going through your trial, God will use fellow believers to administer His comfort to you. If ever you're overwhelmed or trapped or dying, remember that you're not alone. You have a family. This Father of salvation, this Father of compassion, this God of all comfort, He is our Father. That means that in belonging to Him, we also belong to one another. And Paul says that God will use many believers to pray many prayers for you. He says in verse 11, in beautiful words in Greek, he said they will lift up their faces in prayer for you. Beloved, can I tell you that the prayers that we pray for one another, they bring real help from heaven. You know what? Sometimes we're liars. We say, I'll pray for you. And we, we didn't pray. We haven't prayed. We have no intention of praying. <laughs> we just say it, you know, we kind of use it like, get well soon, good luck. Warm wishes, I'll pray for you. No, 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 no. You have to understand our prayers make a difference. Our prayers change things. Our prayers move God to action on others' behalf. Paul says divine favor is bestowed as many believers pray many prayers. Deliverance comes to one as many believers lift up their faces in many prayers. Can I tell you, there are people praying. The reason you're here today is because somebody prayed for you to be here. You got dragged here. You don't even know why you're sitting here. You don't know what you're doing. You're here because somebody prayed for you to be here. Someone you don't even know about. There are people. God is causing many believers to pray many prayers for you. We pray for you when you don't even know we're praying for you. You think you're going to be aboard in heaven? First 10,000 years, we're going to sit down and the angels are going to tell us everything that was happening behind the scenes every moment of every day that we didn't even know how God was causing someone somewhere to make intercession on our behalf. God will use fellow believers to console you to encourage you, to offer practical help to you. God will use apostolic and prophetic and pastoral ministry to energize you to endure this trial. Paul says in verse 6, through us you will be energized to endure. Listen, while you're receiving the word of God right now, something's happening in your spirit and you're getting a little energy to endure. While prophetic ministry happens, you're receiving energy to endure while hands are laid on you, you're being energized to endure. God will use other believers to comfort you and God will comfort you himself directly. 
through Christ in you. The Holy Spirit in you will minister deep strength. He'll strengthen your war-weary mind. He'll strengthen your frayed emotions. He'll strengthen your wobbly will. He'll strengthen your stressed out body. God's presence with you will safeguard you from paralyzing fear. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Remember what our Father has guaranteed. He will comfort you. And finally, listen, somebody, there's a word, somebody you take it. You know what? I got to tell you the truth. They didn't take it in 5.30 last night. They didn't really take it in 8.30 this morning. So I, I need to be happy. So I need somebody here to take it because I have a word for you. Somebody receive it. Somebody wrap your faith around it. Somebody pull it into your heart and embrace it. God has guaranteed he will comfort you. And God has guaranteed that he will deliver you. Paul said we, we went through the worst time of our entire life. We were completely overwhelmed. We were trapped. We felt certain we were going to die. But all of this happened so that we might not rely on ourselves, but that we might rely on God who raises the dead. He has delivered us. He will deliver us right now. On Him we have set our hope that He will always deliver us. Beloved, listen to me. If ever you're overwhelmed or trapped or dying, there's one more thing to remember about our Father. He is the God who raises the dead. Abraham understood that. He went through a 25-year trial. Come on, you think you've had a bad year? <laughs> he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead. At 100 years old, there was no chance of producing an heir. Yet against all hope, he continued hoping because he believed in the God who raises the dead and calls those things that are not as if they were. Abraham understood that God is by his very nature a raiser of the dead. Raising the dead is what God does. Beloved, listen, may God give you grace. He is not merely the God who once raised the dead in the pages of the Bible. Paul said he is the God who raises the dead. What God has always done, he is more than able to yet do. And we have his own guarantee in writing that he will do it. Paul said with this spirit of faith, we believe and so speak. We know that the one who raised up the Lord Jesus will raise us up all also. And that's why Paul can say with complete confidence, he has delivered us. He will deliver us right now on him. We have set our hope that he will always deliver us. Listen, I have a message from God for someone in this place today. You know what? Some of you are just in a season of blue skies and clear sailing. Thank God for that. But I have a message for someone who is overwhelmed or trapped or maybe even dying. This is not how your story ends. It doesn't end here. It doesn't end this way. It doesn't end now. Your story doesn't end in loneliness. Your story doesn't end in poverty. Listen to me, somebody. Your story does not end jobless and homeless. Your story does not end without safe and reliable transportation. Your story doesn't end with your retirement funds eaten up by early withdrawals. Your story doesn't end in bondage to addiction. Your story doesn't end in a broken marriage. Your story doesn't end with your family in a mess. Your story doesn't end with your children lost in the world. God will contend with those who contend with you and he will save your children. 
Your story doesn't end in prison. Your story doesn't end ravaged by disease. Your Father is the author of salvation. He's the originator of compassion. He's the source of all comfort, and He's the God who raises the dead. I want to close with these words from the book of Isaiah, chapter 51. This is for somebody in this place today. If it's for you, receive it. If it's not for you, rejoice. That is for someone, but it's for you, receive it. God says in Isaiah 51, I, even I, am the one who comforts you. Why do you live in fear? The cowering prisoners will soon be set free. They will not die in their dungeons. And they will not lack bread, for I am the Lord God Almighty. Beloved, may God give you grace to receive his word. You will not die in this dungeon, and you will not lack bread. You will not die in this dungeon, and you will not lack bread. You will not die in this dungeon, and you will not lack bread. With a spirit of faith, we believe. And therefore we say, He has delivered us. He will deliver us right now. On Him we have set our hope that He will always deliver us. Come on, stand on your feet and give Jesus a great big praise in this place today. Come on, let's give Jesus a great big praise in this place today.